I'm, I'm going back to really what the Lord has been speaking to me about today, about being real and being where we are. And, you know, that's the only way I know how to preach. That's one thing about me. What, uh, is what you see is what you get. And I don't hide very much. And usually the messages that I get are actually messages to myself first. They always are. And then it's something out of that I can share from, to you. Okay, and I'm hoping I'm hearing from the Spirit because if I'm not hearing from Him, that it's probably not going to do much good. I give you some head knowledge, and I give you some Bible studies, and I can give you some history. But let me tell you what I'm interested in. I'm wanting to be a conduit of what is the Spirit saying to the church today because that's what's relevant. That's what's going to change your life. He said, you'll know the truth, and that truth you know, that's what will make you a free person. So we're all becoming free people. We're not, none of us are completely free yet. Not, nobody's reached perfection yet. Amen. We're all in the struggle. And spiritually, we've been set free. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. We're already freed in our spirit. The problem is not the spirit, the free. The problem is here. It's my soul. It's my mind, my will, and emotion. So I've been teaching on a, a particular word for the last two weeks. Um, and so I'm going to get into that. And, and the word was weary. The word is weary. And so uh, it was interesting, our last ancestry prayer night, a couple of weeks back on Wednesday night, the, it, we have a prayer night, and, and the uh, brother and sister Walbridge had that ancestry prayer night. And Sister Kelly was seeking the Lord and saying, what do you want for this night? And they put songs together, and we pray, and we come together. It's a really special time. If you missed out on it, you need to gather. It's a very intimate time with the Lord and with each other. But she heard the Lord say she, in her spirit, you know, we're like, oh, God said. No, in her unction, she felt that the Lord was leading her to say, play Christmas songs. This was the first Wednesday of December. Play Christmas songs. She's like, well, that's, that don't seem real spiritual. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, but she thought, well, okay. And she hurried again. And so she was obedient. Hallelujah. She was obedient. How y'all know when you argue with something, it's probably him. Because you'll hear it, then your mind goes, uh, nah, I don't want to hear Christmas songs. But she did. While we were here, we, she, played, she had a wonderful play, play, uh, playlist. And, but uh, what was interesting, afterwards, we come back together and we were sharing. And pretty much, uh, there were several people there that night that one line or one word out of those songs jumped out. Of these traditional songs that we sing for years, there was something that jumped out at them and we discussed it. Well, one line that was spoken by Sister Nisa over there, she heard the word, she said, it jumped out at me, the line that says, a thrill of hope. A thrill of hope. And when she said that, in my spirit, immediately it was, there's your Christmas message. Thank you, Sister Nisa. There's your Christmas man. Well, I really didn't know, well, what are you going to do with that? But I knew in my spirit a thrill of hope was going to be the name of this message today. And so um, as I went to, afterward, I sat down a couple weeks, whatever, last week or something, and go, okay, I'm going to flesh that out. What was that? I wrote it down, thrill of hope. I'm thinking, what song is that? Any of y'all know what song that is off your head? Okay, mm, y'all trying to find it, aren't you? Saying, mm, mm. Okay, well, let me just, actually, I wasn't going to do this. We got it on the deal, but I don't know if I can. I'm just going to sing this part. I wasn't going to do that. <clears throat> I'm going <gonna> to <clears throat> make it real gross here. Let's clear my throat, do all this stuff. But uh, it's, uh, it, it, we're just, that's right. It says, oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the Spirit felt its worth. Now listen to this line. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. So fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine. When Christ was born, 
What I didn't realize that the next words after a thrill of hope was the weary world rejoices. The very word that I've been teaching on for two weeks. The Lord spoke to me two weeks and said, let not your heart. He said, don't, don't become weary in well-doing. For in due season you'll reap if you faint not. So I've been teaching on what it means to be weary. And we learned that that word weary is not just to be tired, but it actually is a heart, it's a heart word. It means to really become disheartened, to be heart sick. It's deeper than just a tired body and a, and a mind that's wore out. No, it's something deeper than that. It's way down deep. And this song says, a weary world. A weary world. The first weary I talked about is how we get weary with one another. We get weary with the news. We get weary of looking outside and the things that's bombarding our minds, and it just makes us weary. And we can even get weary with one another. We can get weary in well-doing, and we can look around and go, well, I'm the only one getting here early. Why am I doing this? And I taught all that whole message about being weary in well-doing. But we got to continue. If not, he said, you will faint. And that means you fall out, you let go of your grip. And he said, then you lose your harvest because you don't reap what you went to go start with. And so you just start over the loser loop. And every time you get up, and all of a sudden, if you don't hold on, if you relinquish that and you give up, then what happens, you fall back around the loop and you start over. And that can happen on many levels. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Another relationship, you messed up. Another time, you're going back and getting a chip. Another time, you're having to go and, and pay off this or do this or apologize. All these things that we can become weary if we let go and we stop fighting that fight of faith to hang on. The next weary I talked about last week was becoming weary with ourselves. Regret, remorse. There's nothing any worse after you've already gone around those loser loops a few times ago. What's wrong with me? I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to change. And you get really weary and say, well, whatever. And I know when I worked in the prisons, when you heard somebody say, it's whatever, you better get out of the way. Because they're throwing down and it's whatever. I don't even care what happens. I'm at the point of giving up. It's whatever. And we can get to that place even with ourselves. That we can get weary with ourselves and give up hope and forget that we're in a process. And God's not through with us yet. And he loves me right where I am. He accepts me where I am. But he loves me too much to leave me there. And whatever it takes to put me through to get me on the other side of myself, he's willing to do it. And that's why he said it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Not because he's fixed to go throw you in hell or throw you away. It's because the same way it was a fearful thing to fall in the hands of Joe Perry, my daddy. Because my daddy loved me so much he would not let me get away with doing wrong. The Bible says the Lord loves those he loves, he chastises. So don't worry about it, honey. Quit trying to, you don't have to worry about punishing somebody else. Father's got this, okay? Just get off of, off of them and get on, stay on your own business. Can you stay in your own lane? Somebody needs to hear that. Stay in your own lane. I have to tell myself that. I'm not your, I'm not your daddy, I'm not your mama, I'm not your Jesus. I'm the one that's encouraging you to get to Jesus, but you need to stay in your own lane or you're going to become very weary because then you're carrying burdens that was not yours to carry to start with. Lay it down, Brother Mark. Did a good thing of the day. How heavy is it? Just as long as you hold it. Sometimes you just got to lay it down. So there's weary. You can get weary with the outside coming in. You can get weary from the inside coming out. But when I heard this song, I realized something. It was a weary world was going on when Jesus was born. Do you realize today that the weariness we're talking about is not just in ourselves? It's not just in Christian gathering. It's not just in America, USA. Do you realize that the whole world right now is weary? The 
reason this message is, is, is got a hold and it, it has helped so many of us is because we're weary. And not just us, though. we got to remember, it's not all about us. It's not just you. It's not just the church. It's not just your little four no more. The whole world is weary right now. They're weary just like they were when that little baby was born that those kids just acted out. You need to think about, I've been thinking about what was going on at that time. Let's get this thing in context. Because this, this world was weary. Wow. Proverbs 13 and 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. Israel was waiting. Once again, Israel was in bondage. Once again, they were, had their hope deferred and they were heart sick. They were at a place of, of dis, they, they, they had, I don't know if you realize this, but they had just come out of what we call 400 years of silence. Between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, however you want to look at that, was about 400 years. There was nothing written from the prophets, nothing we have record of. 400 years. That's not just some random number on if something else comes to your mind in 400 years. But back years before, a few hundred years, there was another time Israel had been in bondage for 400 years. They had gone into Egypt and stayed in Egypt way too long. They went there for a cause. They went there to, before of a famine, but they got comfortable and they stayed there to the point they became in bondage. How many knows you go to the world long enough to get your needs met? At first it's okay, but stay too long and what happens? You become a bondage to the thing that you try to go to to get help. You might need those pills for a minute, but you keep on them pills and see what happens. Those pills got you. You might need uh, this to relieve stress for a minute. You might need that. You might need a little entertainment. But you let entertainment become your, your go-to, and before you know it, it don't, it don't satisfy you. Whatever you go through, you can become addicted to it. How many of y'all know I'm talking about? All kinds of things. I like shopping ther uh, therapy. Hey, am I good through Amazon right now? But have me know, y'all know, if I press that, Am that send button on Amazon too much, I can become in bondage to a credit card. So whatever we use, if we use shopping, if we use food, if we use entertainment, if we use drugs, we use alcohol, we use sex, we use whatever is out there to bring you, seeking another relationship to meet your needs. If you do it too long, it will take you in under, and you will be under that bondage. When that the Lord said, would you please set me free? How many of y'all know that there's people, you get weary. People are weary of their sin. It said, long live the world who's, how did he say it? Uh, that that uh, long lay the world in sin and error pining. That, that, era, that pining business was an old word. Uh, I had it here somewhere. That means to waste away. Pine for means to await to, to, with a craving, a longing. And also to feel regretful. In this case, they were feeling regretful for having sinned, and, and they, they couldn't get out of it. Now, here they were 400 years later after Malachi, and they're in bondage again. This time, they're in bondage to Roman rule. Rome was pretty much ruling the area. They were, they were in a place right there that um, uh, northern Africa, uh, Europe right there, the Middle East, they had taken over. And part of what they had taken over during that time, when, when John the Baptist shows up, then Jesus shows up, they're under bondage to Roman rule. How many of y'all know that is what was happening? It was Roman soldiers that sat there and put the nails in his hands at the, at the insistence of the church, the Israelites. But it was Rome. That's what was going on. They were under Roman rule again this is why the apostles and they were all thinking that Jesus was going to do what had been done before how did they get out of bondage before the Lord sent a Messiah called Moses he wasn't the Messiah but he was a person to come and help them and they knew about the songs of Moses and they knew and they were looking for a new Moses it had been prophesied over and over about this Messiah that was going to come and deliver them again and they thought it was going to be a repeat of then and so by now their hope is deferred they're like what is going on we're not hearing anything and here we are under Roman rule and we're back here again they're weary they're weary of what was happening around them but this time when Jesus showed up, the leaders of the church, 
the high pri- the priest and even the high priest, the elders and the rulers had become so corrupt that Jesus looked at him and he calls them, oh, you vipers. I ain't been called a viper lately that in my face I know of. He called some snake. You're vipers. He said, you're hypocrites. It was a hard time. The people was trying to go in and do their, those that were faithful was going in trying to do their sacrifices. And Jesus came and said, you have made my house a den of thieves. They were ripping the people off, stealing from people, selling them sacrifices. And he was so upset with where he said, it's my father's house. It was your father's house. You've become weary. And I taught the scripture. He said, you've become weary coming to me. You've quit coming to me. Now you're trying to make it your own self, your own way. They were a weary world that was pining away. There was people that was looking for him. In the middle of it all, there was the faithful. Jesus looked at those leaders. He said, if you knew the Father, you'd know me. He said, the problem is you quit knowing Father. Jehovah God, you lost the real deal a long time ago. You keep doing sacrifice, you do other stuff, but you're just doing a religious ritual. And now it's all about you. You're making money. You stand up there in your long robes. And you're just trying to be a show. And you become very religious. And people were just, they had to be disgusted with their leaders. Does any of that sound familiar today? Even religious leaders, there's so many things. People are just turned off. They've seen so much failure. They've seen so much corruption that people have just got a sour taste with organized religion. I mean, I know, and rightfully so. There's a lot of things out there that's made people uh, grow weary. But what I want to do, and I know we've done the, uh, a lot of the Christmas story here, but I, there's a few things here I wanted to just to point out, and I'll just kind of jump through it uh, with going back here to get us where, where we are today. But, you know, we just saw those little angels come in, and they, uh, the, the shepherds, I mean. And it's really interesting who Jesus came to first. The Bible said he came to his own. That means he came to his own family. He means he came to the Israelites. He was an Israelite. He was he seen his lineage. He was of the of the um, you know of the children of Abraham. He was part of that covenant in in the natural. He had come there. But it's interesting. Now he's going to show up. What's long awaited is fixing to happen. They don't really know it. It's just another day, and the shepherds are out there watching their sheep. But it wasn't going to be just another day. How many of y'all know suddenly things can change? But it's interesting. When you look, take a step back, you see how the whole picture comes together. But when you're in it, it don't really seem like a whole picture. It just seems like whatever today. You know, it's just today. So they're out there doing the do, just doing their job. And all of a sudden, there is this angel that comes to them uh, in Luke. And it said, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were afraid. Like, whoa, what's that? Wouldn't you be? But the angel Lord came upon them and said, and the, oh, I read that. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. It wasn't just going to be to you Jews. It wasn't just be the children of Israel that had the first covenant. This is going to be for all people. Say all people. Say that's me. This is something that's happening for all people. For unto you is born to stay in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, I love this part. I had to say this because when I saw it, I don't know if it means anything to you, but it was really precious to me. Why is it called, why is it called the city of David? Bethlehem's called the city of David because that's where David lived. That's where David was born. Do you realize that David in the same Bethlehem where Jesus was born, where the same area where those people are out there, these shepherds are, are, are taking care of the flocks, is the same area that David was out there in his harp? It was the same place where David fought a lion and a bear. It all came together. It's the same David was a shepherd. He was a forerunner of our shepherd, our great and one shepherd today, the good shepherd. And it all comes, everything fits together in the Bible. It's the coolest thing. So here they are, and they're going to go back to where this started with David. And it said, the city of David, this will be a sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swollen clothes. A line in a manger. And suddenly with them was a multitude of angels with a heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And so, but anyway, they said, Let us go to Bethlehem and let's go tell everybody about what the Lord has made known to us. And he goes and they see the baby. And, and so it says, And they, they went and they rejoiced greatly and they just spread it. It said they, they made it abroad, telling everybody. 
That's that song, come and see what God has done. That's what they did. They ran if they saw the baby, and they tell it said they were rejoicing and praising the Lord. They made haste, and they went and did this. So this is uh, what's going on in the stable, and we're going to go back over to, to Matthew in a minute. But this is what from this view. And then what's interesting right here, if you go on down, they're in the stable. All this happens, and then it says eight days later, what did the, they do for the Jewish sons? They circumcised them on the eighth day. So they didn't get to hang out in that stable very long. They had to make their way from Bethlehem back to Jerusalem to present Jesus in the temple to be circumcised and to offer the offerings because that was their tradition. It's a good thing Mary, I hope she had an easy delivery because she was back on that donkey going back somewhere real fast if it was a donkey. I don't really know. It doesn't tell us all that. But here they go, and they go to the, the, to the, to the temple. And here's what's happened. So they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. They dedicated their baby. How many of y'all have dedicated babies? Bring them in the tabernacle. This is where this comes from. It's not just in the Old Testament, but Jesus, they did this. And it said they offered sacrifice. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Okay, so Simeon was the same. He was a just and a devout man. He was one of those that did not lose his relationship with Jehovah God. He's still looking for Messiah. He, was st he had stayed faithful in his heart. He was just and devout. He said, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. What's the consolation of Israel? That means to be consoled. They were waiting for Israel to have some consoling because Israel was in a bad way again. They were back in bondage. They were not in a good way, and they needed some consolation. They were hurting. And this man was there, and he said, in the Holy Ghost, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he had been told, you're not going to die before you see the Messiah. Okay? So he was looking. He was expecting. And he said, and by the Spirit, he came to the temple. So he had one of those little urges like what Nisa had with the song, what different ones. You have that little urge, I need to go do this, like Sister Kelly had the urge to play Christmas music. You didn't know the message was going to come out of that and with you and this thing. And, and so he had an urge. He said he came by the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, he took Jesus in his arms and he blessed God and said, Now let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which has been prepared before, before the face of all people. Again, it's all people. The second person here, all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The Gentiles is us again. He was saying right from the beginning, this is a change. The Old Testament, the covenant was just for the Jews, the children of Israel. But this is a new day. And this is going to be for the world. God so loved the world. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This was going to be bigger, and it started right there at eight days old in the temple. And, so, and also there was one Anna, a prophetess which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in at that instant gave thanks likewise to the Lord and spake of him to all them, all, all, all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. This woman at the very instant there, that this one man's doing it, she walks in and there's two people confirming right there. And it was about all. She goes and tells everybody in Jerusalem what was happening. This woman right here, this prophetess, she was an elderly lady. She was a widow. It tells about, I didn't read all the things about her. But here we are, two people right there confirming. We have angels. We have shepherds. Now we have these two prophetess, prophet and prophets in the temple talking about that this was something that was for the world. Now I'm going to jump back over here to Matthew's story, and we saw part of this here, and I'm going to read that. Um, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. We're going to talk about what was happening at that day. It was Herod was king at this time. And behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Okay, these were not Jewish people that had the law of Moses, that had the scriptures, that had the prophets. These were strangers. These were Gentiles. 
apparently pretty wealthy. They had brought some pretty good gifts there, some gold, frankincense, and myrrh, whatever that is. They said, we have come to worship. They came for one reason, to worship a king. They were looking for him. I don't know what prompted them, except they saw a star, and something inside these Gentiles said, we've got to go. And, um, and when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. I used to wonder about that. Why was all Jerusalem worried? Well, you'll find out real fast they had reason. They knew this king. They knew what was happening in their world at the time. It was a hard time to be alive with Herod as your king. And he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together and demanded of them that, where was where's this Christ supposed to be born at? Now, he was supposed to be a Jew. He was actually designated by the Romans to oversee and rule on their behalf. Okay? But he demanded, where, where's this Jesus going to be born at? And then they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. They knew that the people around him, he didn't really know. He hadn't read the scriptures, obviously. But the scribes and the priests did. For thus it was written by the prophet that in Bethlehem and the land of Judah, thou art not the least of the princes of Judah, for out of you will come a governor will rule my people Israel. This was an Old Testament prophecy there. Then Herod, when he hears this, when he privately called the wise men, he inquired of them diligently, when did that star appear? When did you see this? So he sent to them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. I wonder how true that rang. He was a shyster right there. When they heard the king, they departed and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them. We saw the little star a while ago leading them, right? The star went before them until it stood over where the young child lay. And when they saw the star... They rejoice with exceeding great joy. It's the same thing that the shepherds did, exceeding great joy. I think that right there is where that thrill of hope, there was a thrill that came with hope. I Actually, I think I wrote down what the word thrill meant here somewhere, and I may look at it, but I, I looked that up, and that's this excitement. Oh, to affect with a wave of sudden keen emotion or excitement. That's that tremble song, too, y'all sing. He said it can make you tremble. It's a thrill. When you really, really get that song, you will do a little more than what we were doing a while ago. There's a trembling. There's a thrill. They, they, they had this thrill, and they came, and they found him. And when they come to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother, fell down, worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented him gifts. And then they warned of God in a dream that they should, not, they should not return to Herod, but they departed into their own country another way. Okay, so for, first of all, they changed. I love the way they did this. They got a little more biblical, the play, because they did not bring the, the kings to the stable. If you notice that, they moved the animals. Because the reality is they didn't make it. We have the picture of the nativity, but they really, it took them apparently about two years because the king said, when did you hear and then he's fixing to do something here that tells you that he knew that it was about two years. So probably it took them about two years to get there. What? Two years? Well, they came from the east. And let me remind you, there was no trains, planes, and automobiles. They probably were riding camels because they were able to go long distances. It was a mode of transportation. Or they was on a donkey or they were ride, riding or walking. But it took them a long time to get there. That's why they got the thrill of hope. They even changed the baby doll out to about a two-year-old while ago and held him. Did y'all see that? Thank y'all for teaching our kids. Not we're going to fall out of there. But it's, it's a big deal because it took them a long time to get there. Some people can't even get to church when it's five minutes down the road. These people went two years to see the game. Because they were weary of what they had. And they'd been waiting a long time for something. The Israelites had it. Do you know the only people in the world at that time that had this thing with God, this, this Jehovah God thing, was this little group of people in this little tiny area in the world that we call Israel. Back then it was a little bit bigger, but that area right there. And they were failing. They, they had lost the hope. But here they are, these kings from afar are going, we want to find this king. 
We want to find him because what we have is not enough. There was something inside those Gentiles that was looking for more. I believe we're living in a world of Gentiles that's looking for more. I think there's a world of Jews that are looking for more. They ain't got the Messiah yet, but he is here. When that's what our job is to do, to say there's a thrill of hope. In a weary world, we know what it takes to rejoice because we have had a thrill of hope in our lives. How many of y'all remember when you first really, really made him your king? When you're really recalled to getting saved, some people that's, you know, we have a lot of words, religious words, but there comes a time you can believe in Jesus, confess Jesus, but there is that time he comes more than a Savior. He becomes Lord. And sometimes it takes a lot of persecution, and we call it getting to the bottom of the barrel. Whatever it takes is finally go, okay, I give up. I can't do it alone. I admit I'm helpless over this thing. It's got me. I thought I had it, but it's got me, and I need you. And I give it all to you. I make you Lord and King. The world needs to see some people that can go out and tell people he can be your King. We have told them, oh, just Jesus, your Savior, love Jesus, and you won't go to hell. Do you know they're not really worried too much about heaven and hell right now? They're worried about the heaven and hell. They're living it in their home, in our nation, our world, in their finances. This is the real deal, guys. Religion made it all out there. Jesus made it all here right now. From the beginning, he was a present help in the time of trouble. We've got news. We've got real good news. It's called the gospel. But what we've been giving people wasn't new and it wasn't good. It was not. We gave people a bunch of uh, do this or do that. Do this or do that. That is not the message of Jesus. This thing never depended on what we do. He's the one who made the decision. I didn't ask your permission or your participation. I'm going to come down. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He said, I'm going to go back and redeem my people. It was actually the plan the whole time, guys. When he put him in the garden and gave him a tree uh, of opportunity to make a decision, he knew what they were going to do. That's why the Bible said the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. He already had a solution for what Adam was going to do and what you were going to do and what I was going to do. He already knew what he's going to take care of his babies. Do y'all know the devil doesn't win? Oh, my God, I'm so, so sick and tired of people putting Satan up there next to God and giving him, oh, the devil. No, I am not worried about the devil. I'm not worried about the adversary. What I'm not out here, I'm worried about the adversary right in here that's trying to get me off track and lose my hope and lose my faith in a Jesus who's faithful, who's got a message to give people. You don't have to come to our church. You don't have to do anything. But let me tell you about my Jesus who did it for you. And all he needs you to do. And won't you just receive it so you can get out of your hell now and have a little bit of heaven now and take it to the other side. Because at the best, this world is, is got full of trouble. And we got a lot of stuff. I don't care the best of the best. We all deal with stuff. We all get weary. Oh, I've got some scriptures to back this up. I don't know. Oh, hallelujah. I've been preaching. Is this as good as it feels to me? I feel like I just started. Thank you, Sister Carol. She's in my corner. You ever seen that meme when the pastor's saying, it said, the, the, this, I'm closing, and someone goes, keep going there. Everybody's looking, I'm like, did you just say that? Put a mask on that woman. Get a muzzle on it. I'm all over the place here. We're in a weary world. And what they looked for, God gave them a star. I love it. A light. The shepherds saw the star. The king saw the star. Do you know a star is, the sun is a star? The stars have their own light, just like the sun does. The moon doesn't have a light of its own. It reflects. It just reflects. The stars are like a chip off the old block. They're all part. Do you know we're all stars? We have our own light. It's his light that's in us. And you're shining when you don't even feel like you're shining. Are you, mad? you might be acting bad. But even in the badness, I'm telling you what, if you will get the, get the bushel off your head of condemnation, 
quit trying to hide because you feel like you ain't doing it right. Get over that already and let him shine. It never was about you. And the best testimony to the world, that it, the people out there that's looking is like, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> like, hey, if he loves me, he can love you. And you say, hey, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not even, I'm not even close to that, but his love for me is perfect. And I, he's not through with me. And sometimes even our failures become the best testimony to go, man, I wish I hadn't have done that, but I'm so glad that my God loves me and he's merciful. And he's a God not of one chance, two chance, three. He was seven times 70. He's more than that. If he requires us to forgive each other 70 times 70, how much more? He said, will he forgive us? Oh, that's hard. For, we get weary with ourselves. I should, I should know better. I should be over that. Yeah, you should. But the truth is, he's not shooting on it. i got to be careful with that. You're shooting on yourself. And you hide it. Okay. I say that every time. It's funny. Every time. I, I'm very careful. But it's a very serious word. I say it because it's important. It changed me. And when I'm talking to myself, y'all talk to yourself? You better be. You need to be having self-talk. But I hear myself sitting and saying, Pam, you should, should. And I say, wait a minute, stop right there. I stop myself right there. Wait a minute. What am, I, what am I needing to deal with right there? If not, I will get weary with myself. Let me tell you what the world, let me tell you the scripture today, what they're looking for at the stars. I'm going to go over here to Romans. I don't know if I finished there or not, but um, it's okay. We did it plenty. Uh, Romans 8, which is one of my favorite, my favorite chapters. I'm going to just kind of lead through here. But um, let me tell you again, this Roman, this is Romans. And what that was was a letter written to Rome, right? Uh, Paul, and I forgot to look at it. I can't remember. Some of y'all probably remember that Paul was a, not only he was an Israelite, he was a Jew of Jews. He was very uh, schooled and he was very uh, affluent in the Jewish community, but he was also a citizen of Rome. And I can't remember what the details of that was, but he, I don't know if his parents were there, he was born or something. He was also a citizen of Rome. That's interesting because God called Paul uh, knowing that he was a citizen of Rome and how that would all play into it because Rome was going to be the one that they were under at the time. But now he's writing a letter back to Rome. Now these letters are interesting because I'm talking about the world. Oh, this is what I didn't tell you. I've got to go back to this. Yeah, this is really important right here. About Herod. Let me see where it's here. Uh, when Herod, when I'm just going to tell you, I forget where it's at, which one it's at. But when Herod discovered, when he, when he realized about the king, to try to stop this, he found out, he said, well, it's about two years ago, apparently. He went out and sent a word and said, all the male babies, two and under, will be killed. He said, all the babies, all the little males, so th under three two and below would be killed because he was hoping to kill this Messiah that was been prophesied that was going to be born. And these kings said, oh, we saw it. He's like, whoa, this must be serious. These people have been coming a long time to get here. They saw this a couple years ago, and they've been traveling. So can you imagine living in a world where your king, your leader, your president, whatever, had the power because he was afraid somebody was going to threaten his throne, take his place, that he would just order all the baby, all the male babies be dead. Kill them. Can you imagine what that looked like? It said because the prophet was going to, it said there was a prophecy that said there would be uh, uh, lamentations and groanings and mournings that they couldn't even stop because the mothers would cry so loud. It was prophesied that the tears, that the moaning would come up, all the wailing. I've, I've seen drawings. They found drawings of this way back in the years before, of them taking uh, children and, and little boys, by little babies by their legs and, and bashing them against the, against the cement, against the rock walls of the homes. Or taking swords, they would just slaughter them. Can you imagine this, real, this happened? But you know that wasn't the first time. Remember I said he, uh, Moses was a forerunner? Do you realize that Pharaoh did the same thing trying to kill Moses? He had a dream that there was going to be a, a Messiah born that was going to take over and, and he would be his demise. And so he did the same thing. He ordered all the male children under uh, two and under to be killed. Same thing back then. A forerunner. That's the kind of world they lived in. And we're over here whining and thinking, oh, somebody's going to take my rights. Well, you might, and that's not a good thing. We want to fight for our rights, but the truth is nobody's ripping your babies out of your arm and bashing their heads against the cement. 
But this was the world. This is how evil it was. It was how wicked it was. This is why they, when they got a thrill of hope, they, oh, my gosh, there's a Messiah. He's here. He's going to deliver us from these tyrants, these people that killed my baby, killed my neighbor's baby, my cousin's baby, all of us. They killed all those children under three. This is the world that they lived in at this time. And then, okay, Jesus comes, and they think he's going to be the Messiah, or he's going to be the Moses, and he wasn't. He was going to be Messiah, but it wasn't going to look like what they thought it was going to look. Do you know he never messed with Roman rule? He never addressed it. He did not get involved with the local government. In fact, he said, you give Caesars what's Caesars. Oh, I know he's overtaxing you. I know he's doing stuff. But you know what? God will provide. Peter, you need to pay your taxes. Why are you getting money? Well, go to fishing. Well, I can do that. <laughs> he caught a fish that had gold in his mouth enough to pay the taxes. Do you not know God will provide for you? He'll provide for you to obey the laws of your land. Unless it's some sinful thing they're having you do. This is where we're at. Let's get real. He did not overthrow the Romans. In fact, it got worse. After Jesus came, after the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden now the church is under severe persecution. The persecution wasn't just from Rome now. It's from the church itself or the Israelites who rejected Jesus. Those Jewish leaders are just like the king didn't want to be taking their place. That's why they crucified Jesus. Because they, he said, you're king of the Jews? No, you're not our king. And so this is where we are again. And now the church is under such persecution that they had to run for their lives. And so that's why we have all these letters called uh, 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 the Corinth, uh, Corinth, Corinthians. That's the, le that's the church at Corinth. Uh, Philipp Philippines, Philippians, that's the church in Philippi. Romans is the church in Rome. So these are people that left, scattered, and took the gospel and set up now. They're all around the world because they've been scattered because of persecution. So what looked like a really bad thing, the Bible said it ended up being a good thing. Because if not, they would just sit around and had church all day long in Jerusalem. How many of y'all just want to take, we just want to sit around and have church? I'll tell you what COVID's done. It's, it's scattered some things, and it's brought some things. And I'm telling you what, you can do nothing against the gospel, only for it. And it will turn around for good if you just hang on long enough. Oh, don't you count yourself out. Don't count anybody out too soon. Especially not God. He ain't lost any control. He's not lost any control. There's a bigger picture that is happening. It's going to happen. We're just in the details right now. We can't see it. Right? So here we are. They're now all over. And they're in terrible persecution. They're being fed to the lions. They're, being, they're fighting in the arenas. They're using them for sport. They're throwing them in jail. We, right there, even Apostle Stephen, Paul, before he was still Saul, before he got converted, he stood there and had them stone that boy to death and preaching a wonderful revival and many people being saved and healed and miracles. He was stoned. Stoning is a pretty graphic death. It's not like the guillotine. No, it's a long, torturous thing, just like crucifixion was, which was a, germ, was a, was a, a Roman way of torturing people to death. That's the world they lived in. You didn't die quick. You didn't get no lethal injection. You got hung on a cross. You, got, you had terrible things. You got stoned to death. So here we are, and this time, when you read the letters, you need to get them in context because it was under great duress. Great stress and great problems is we can get encouraged to see how they got through it. But Romans 8, and I'm just going to look at 18. I'm going to jump through here. Uh, 18, excuse me, I'm not in Romans. I'm still over here in Luke. Romans 8, and I'm just going to jump through here. Verse 18 uh, says, now here's Paul. He sounds a little Texan right here. He says, for I reckon. See there? We are all right. We can say reckon. I reckon, my daddy used to say reckon, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, a lot of your, I've, I was going to use a different version of the Bible, but there's so many, some of the things, this is one of them that just irks me. They, they translate to say that the glory that were revealed to us, but that's not the truth. If you read the rest of it, you realize it was not about being revealed to us. It was being revealed through us. He said, the glory shall be revealed in us. The glory is the manifestation of God, His Spirit. 
He said, then he goes, for the earnest expectation of the creature awaiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. The world is weary, waiting for the manifestation of us, the God in us. Your neighbor may be waiting. Your co-worker's waiting. He said, the whole world, the creature is our humanity. They're waiting for the manifestation or the revealing of the true people of God. 22, it says there, 822, for we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Here they are, they're suffering. He's writing to the church in Rome. This is a Roman church. Because he, he, he went to Roman chains. He went home to whatever he went to Rome. He went there because he was uh, being tried and they took him in chains at there. And, and it was terrible just getting there. Shipwreck, all kind of stuff happened to the man. But here he is. He's now writing to the church that's in Rome now. They've scattered there. And it's not just the Jewish people. But now there's some Gentile people that's been born into the church. And he's talking to them. He said, we, us other people we've been persecuted here we are we're in rome now we all know that everybody's groaning and travailing in pain can you imagine they felt like everybody was because it felt like have you have you ever been to suffering you think everybody's suffering but the truth is we're right now the whole world is groaning we're in this boat together because we've never been here before nobody's been here before he said um they were trailing but, but not only they, let's go to the next verse. But not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. He said it's not just the world that's groaning right now. It's us too. It's the church. We're waiting to get out of here. He said, man, we're ready to get out of here. But he says, but, well, we, are, but we are saved by hope. That's, we're saved or delivered because we have hope. But hope that it seems not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then with patience we can wait for it. The thrill of hope. It's hope that people are looking for. They're looking for hope. I had the, de rev the de definition, what I think it was, one of the, it said that hope is believing that what is wanted or desired will come to pass or work out for best. To look forward with expectation or trust. I always say it's, it's expecting good to come. He said, if you don't lose your hope, if you don't lose your hope, if you don't lose the thrill of hope, then you can have patience to wait for whatever it is you're going through. They were going through severe persecution, much more than probably any of us. But we all have our stuff we're going through. He says, for we hope, because the Spirit helps our infirmities. We don't know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He searches the hearts. He knows what's the mind of the Spirit, and he's making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Last week I told you where Jesus told Peter, you're going to fail me, Peter, but I'm praying for you that your faith fail not. By here this says the Holy Spirit is praying for you. Y'all, you're not alone in this. He's interceding. For us to get through whatever it is you're going through. Because verse 28 then saw, that sums it up. Because there is a payoff. He said, you will what? You'll reap if you don't faint. He said, for we know. And we know that all things work together for good. Those that love God, those are called according to his purpose. Hang on. Hang on. This is what we need to tell the world but they're waiting on us. They're groaning for the manifestations. Get the condemnation off. Get the lies off. Get over whatever you've gotten it and let the world know that there is a hope that's in this world. I'm going to just throw this in there for some of you guys that might need this because I, 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 this was interesting to me. Um, and as people are talking to us today, it, it, this, is, this is really important because what we're hearing, people want to draw me into uh, discussions about end time. 
And we were talking the other night, uh, it's something we had, and somebody was talking about somebody was coming to them and saying, well, what about this, and it worked, and what about the mark of the beast, and what about this, and they were wanting to get into, do you think this is the end time, do you think that the, the one world government, and uh, how many of y'all hear all these questions, and they're out there, but the sister was really good about it because she didn't get pulled into that. She basically said, you know, I don't really know about all that, I'm qu just kind of paraphrasing, but I do know that where you're focused, right now you need to be focused on what's going on in your home. We can get distracted and want to give energy to try to figure all this stuff out and trying to figure out revelations and all that stuff. Well, you know what you need to do is figure out right now where you and the Lord are in your home. And so all that's going to take care of itself if you're walking with him. How many of y'all know there's a shortcut to this? We don't need to know everything about revelation. I'm not saying, I'm just telling you there's a lot of stuff there that's, Okay, I'm not going to get off on it and tell you. But if you're interested, I'll talk to you. I don't really talk a lot of from here because what it does, it peace people cross with you. And they think, oh, if I, they don't believe that alike, I can't believe anything else. Do you know that we can do a lot of things together? We don't have to believe everything the same. I don't think two people in the house think about end time the same. And that's okay because things are being revealed as we get there. But I can tell you this, that whatever is going on right now, I'm just going to say this. It sounds weird. Do you... I hear people saying all the time, and the news says it, and everybody says that the world is getting worse. The world's getting darker. The world's this going to hell in a handbasket, basically, especially America. Man, we're doomed. Do you know if you look at the bigger picture, step back, the world is not getting worse. The world is getting better. Well, the news doesn't say that. Let me just read you something I, jumped, I looked at. When Jesus was a baby, the Roman Empire dominated the civilized centered around Europe, Middle East, Northern Africa. In Italy at that time, approximately 49% of its population consisted of slaves. Let's go back to Jesus' days. 49% were slaves. They were taking over the world, and as they conquered nations, they either killed the people or they took them as slaves. That's what was happening. That's the world back then. Let's talk about how it gets better. Between 19, okay, in the last 160 years, life expectancy in the United States has risen from 39.4 years in 1860 to 78.9 years in 2020. Let me say this again. In 1960, I mean, 1860, United States, the lifespan, the average lifespan was 39 years, four months. Most people in America... Did not live to see 40. Did you know that? Let me tell you lately what's happened. Between 1960 and 2015, the life expectancy for the total population in the United States increased by almost 10 years. In 1960, the average was 69.7. In 2015, it was 79.4. 69 to 79. There's been a marked progress in reducing poverty over the last decades. Since 1990, more than 1.2 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. Let me say that again. Since 1990, more than 1.2 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. And the child mortality rate has dropped more than half in the world. You don't hear that on the nightly news. Of course, oh, get this. Now, what about the church? Oh, the church is declining. Mm -hmm. Christianity is going on too. Mm -hmm. According to the 2002 Pew Research Center survey, which has been doing this for years, there were more than 2.2 billion Christians around the world in 2010. More than three times as many as the 600 million recorded in 1910. In 100 years... We went from 600 million recorded to 2.2 billion. The deceiving enemy tries to make us look like it's all going down the tube. Even in America, we know that you look at different statistics. You know, they can all be, they can be messed with. But statistics... One of the problems with statistics with that is people are leaving, y'all know this, mainstream denominations. There's little churches like Christian Gathering popping up all over, right? 
Victory Tabernacle, Joy Center, Hope Center, whatever. They got all these words. It's not so much First United this, First United that. It's a lot of just people are meeting in homes. But even that, what I marvel at is back when I was, oh, I guess in my 20s, uh, the largest church in America was First Baptist Dallas, and I think the membership was like 6,000 people. It was the largest church in America. Now we have many churches, over 30,000 members. We call them mega churches. They're buying out stadiums. Don't tell me Christianity is dying. What we do have a rise in is the number of people that will say, um, I don't even know if I believe in God. I'm an atheist. I don't really don't care. I don't say I'm anything. Because they're being honest now because they can do that. It's, it's okay to do that now. But that does, they're just being honest. Guys, the Bible, here's how I believe. People say, well, Jesus is coming back because the world is in a bad shape. Let me tell you something. That's not the criteria of him coming back. The criteria of him coming back is my glory shall cover the earth. I will make a state in that. I can say that. I don't know all the answers to the end time. I don't know everything happens after we die. But I do know this, that his glory, he's coming back for a glorious, victorious church. He's not coming for some little rag muffin hiding behind a rock like I was taught raising up. You better hide because they're going to cut your head off. They're going to do this, all this stuff. And we had this gloom and doom, this terrible picture. And some people believe he's going to take the church out. Then he's going to pour out his wrath. And it's going to be all this terrible thing. I personally don't believe that at all I believe whatever wrath whatever happened that need to be punished was put on the back of Jesus Jesus paid for all of our sin he paid for every single ugly deed that was done or ever will be done God is not a bloodthirsty God God waiting to take vengeance on people Pour out his wrath. Well, what about the scriptures? What about them? I know all of them, I promise you. But you know what I'm doing? I'm not leaving any out, but I'm, I'm looking at the answers. But I'm starting with the end in mind. I'm going to teach on that. What I do, the end was always a perfect picture. The aim was always his bride being reconciled to him. And it might get really ugly and dirty and all that stuff might happen. There might be a mark of the beast. There might be in all that kind of stuff, tribulation. But let me tell you something. The whole reason for it is not to punish people. The whole thing is to bring people to their knees. So they say, fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. He will let us go through hellfire and brimstone like he did the early church to get them out of their comfort zone and get them to Rome and get them to Philippi and get them to Ephesus and get them out of their comfort zone and get them out there. If we have to lose services in here again, I don't know. I promise you, more people heard my messages during COVID, me sitting on my porch speaking to people all over, listen to my message on the Internet. And I'm telling you, he's a lot more interested in people getting the good news than they are us getting to sit on our patty pews. As much as I love it, as much as we need it, there's something more important. He is not just worried about his church anymore. He's worried about the world. It's not about the Israelites. Now, an Israel is somebody who's a wooden heart. He's not just looking at us. He's always loved the world. And he's challenging us to do it. I can tell you I am looking forward to speaking at Frank's funeral. His memorial, because Frank is why I, there's a lot of you that's done it, but Frank took my words literally and went out there and was hands and feet of Jesus to the world. He and I are the same age. I'm like three months older, and he always rubbed that in. But I'm gonna tell you something. He did more in his little time of coming out of drugs, out of prison, out of the stuff that he was in for years that dominated him. I got to be with his daughter, and she was so blown away by the comments y'all make. She's like, I didn't know. My daddy's like a hero. I said, yes, he is. He's a celebrity around here because he brought food to, to Carol's village. Because he took care of me and Gary. He's the only person I just let him show up at my house at 7 o'clock, unannounced. He said, I ain't going to bother you, Miss Pam, but I got this for you. I'll leave it here on the porch. It just might be the simplest little thing. He didn't ask much from me. I didn't realize where he's gone. He was not a squeaky wheel. I miss him. People going to miss you when you're gone? You need time to make up for lost time. We got life to do. We got a weary world that's moaning and groaning for the manifestation of the true children of God. What a real Christian looks like. They look like an imperfect man called Frank.
they look like y'all. You're overcomers. No, I don't think. Even the world, you can Google these things and you can look it up, you'll find out. This world is not getting worse. Even in the look at the United States, I'll tell you what, I thank God I don't live in them good old days. They wasn't so good. My forefathers had to wash their, their, their clothes down in a creek and on a rock. I'd rather have my Maytag. Oh, don't you buy the lie. Things are getting worse. Oh, it's better. And you were chosen for such a time as this. And I have the opportunity to make it better. I might invent the next thing. You might. Your children might. We have opportunity. He said, you have opportunity to do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. It's what real Christianity looks like. A thrill of hope. A weary world. Rejoicing. The song had it. Waiting for the patiently for the glory that's hid, that's been there in us, that's there in us now. Blessed in the man, Jeremiah 7 is, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters. This is Jeremiah 17, 7. It's like a tree planted by the waters who spreads her roots by the river. And what, when the heat comes, it'll, they'll still have leaves. And even when the drought comes, they will not cease yielding their fruit. That's you and me. Blessed is the man who has hope in the Lord. Lord, we thank you today for the word that you gave us. Because this is not my word, it's yours. I thank you, Lord, you reminded us it's not just me not to get weary. But there's a world around me. I can't miss them in my own weariness. The church cannot get weary at this time. This is the glory hour. We are to be the glory producers and say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because the glory is coming out of us. And people will see our good works and glorify our Father that's in heaven. Let us not be weary in doing good works. Let us not be weary in doing good. If our hearts have become weak and hurt or disheartened today, I pray that you heal us right now. Let us get go of any bitterness that might be encroached in there. Any unforgiveness that can, can hinder me. That can put a bushel over the light that you've given me. For such a time as this in a world that's in sin and error. They're pining. They're, they're in regret. They're in remorse. We have the good news to bring. We are those that carry the gospel. We are your hands and feet.